We can get started. Okay, let's go. Akale uh, Brookline, and that's in my native language. It means good evening, Brookline. I hope you all are doing well in these tough times. My name's Adeni Genesi, originally from Nigeria, but now I call Brookline my own, and America's my adopted country. I would like to say welcome, and thank you all, everyone, for being here for this COVID-101 forum panel. As you all know, COVID-19 took the world by surprise and stopped us in our tracks. Some of us have lost loved ones, and our prayers goes out to those who are dealing with the pain from their losses. Some have suffered from depression, some boredom, and that's just the tip of the iceberg of what we have to deal with as human beings. So now the medical world in record time tells us that we have a solution. It's called a vaccine. So today we'll be focusing on the vaccine, gathering as much information as we can from our medical panel in order to help us make a decision about taking the vaccine or not. So I'll be your co-moderator today alongside my beautiful, strong sister, Kimberly Richardson. She'll be introducing herself as, long, uh, as well as our panel. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us tonight um, for this panel. Um, my name is Kimberly Richardson. I am a Brookline Housing Authority resident. I've been in Brookline since 2013. I am a mother of eight, a grandmother of two. I am a social work student, um, soon to be a social worker. I am a judicial secretary. Um, I've been a, for 24 years now. Um, and tonight we're gonna try to provide some helpful information about the vaccine any questions that you might have, any concerns that you might have. And at the end of the um, program or at the end of the panel, we're gonna sh um, share um, vaccine rollout information for um, BHA um, residents. And so I'm going to introduce um, this powerful panel and I will start um, tonight. We'll hear from Dr. Mary Bassett, a physician, a former health commissioner for New York City, director of the FXP Center for Health and Human Rights at Harvard, where she works as an epidemiologist. Dr. Mary was also in charge of the largest health department in, in our country. So that's wonderful. We are honored to have her here. Um, Dr. Natalia Linos is the executive, executive director of the FXP Center for Health and Human Rights. Dr. Linos and Dr. Bob and Dr. Bassett both serve on the Poor People's Campaign COVID-19 Justice Advisory Committee. We also have Cassandra Munbrum, she is a nurse leader at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and she's also, uh, she serves as a Dotson member of the Simmons University Boston Bridge and Mentoring Program and Vice President of the New England Regional Black Nurses Association. Um, the panelists, um, will, we're going to hold a, a conversation today. We'll, you'll hear some questions. We're going to go back and forth and just kind of talk about um, the vaccine and try to offer some support. So my first question is going to be um, directed to Dr. Mary Bassett. Um, as a former health commissioner of the New York City Health Department, do you wanna say a few words about how you view the vaccine rollout going and whether equity has been highlighted enough? Second part to that question. When do you think we can go back to <laughs> normal? Well, <laughs> all right, let me start with, with the first part and, and, um, and let, let me uh, talk both the, about the nation as a whole and, um, and what I understand about Massachusetts, although uh, obviously the Massachusetts Department of Public Health is the best source of information uh, about Massachusetts. So uh, on average now, it's estimated that a, a close to um, 19%, uh, uh, that's nearly one in five uh, Americans have been, um, have been vaccinated uh, in the United States as a whole. And so, you know, that's pretty good. Um, the goal is that for everyone who doesn't have contraindications, uh, for whom the vaccine has been shown to be safe and effective, that we should reach 100%. And so 20% is, you know, is a ways off from that. And you'll often hear people talking about something called herd immunity, uh, which is when we get enough um, protection from the vaccine, from the virus in the population, that the likelihood that one person will run into somebody who they can infect will be pretty low because people have either been protected by having had COVID or having been immunized with the vaccine. 
So um, that number is often given as 80%, but nobody really knows what it is. Um, measles is uh, an example of a highly contagious virus. And for that, we want to hit 90%. Really, we, we want everyone um, to get the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, and we're not that close. Uh, about 22% of Massachusetts residents have been vaccinated. So Massachusetts is doing a bit better than the country as a whole. Now you asked about equity and that's a, a really important question. And the main dimension against which we can measure equity is racial ethnic group, which uh, as we all know in the United States tracks closely with income um, and also reflects the impact of discrimination uh, against people on the basis of their race ethnicity. We know that people who are black or Latino or indigenous were more likely to get infected with COVID, were more likely to be hospitalized with COVID and were more likely to die. And not just by a little bit, but two, three fold uh, the, the chance. And now we're seeing the same kind of disparities roll into vaccination. And on average across the nations, whites are about twice as likely to be vaccinated um, as compared to, um, as to compared to people of color. Now, Massachusetts is doing a little bit better uh, in terms of racial ethnic gaps in vaccination coverage. Uh, but I, I think that something like 82% of vaccines so far have gone to the white population who comprise 70% of the population. So as in every state, um, the um, whites have disproportionately received the vaccine compared to other groups. So this isn't good. The groups that have the highest risk of getting infected, the highest risk of being hospitalized and the highest risk of dying are disproportionately um, not, uh, not um, vaccinated. So we can talk about why that is, um, but I, I feel like I've given a long enough answer already. I, I love that answer. And actually I would love for um, Natalia and Cassandra to chime in on that because I was gonna ask you, why do you think that is? And I think that's, I, I, we should chat about that. Um, yeah, well, yeah. well I'll, I'll turn it over to the other panelists, but I think um, that one part is access. Where can you get a vaccine? And the other part is, you know, people's concerns, um, including valid concerns. All concerns are valid um, about the safety and effectiveness of the vaccine. I can jump in on the access piece a little bit, and this is something that actually Dr. Bassett has spoken and thought about a lot is, you know, the eligibility criteria that we set out. Age was the, the first one, the cutoff, and by definition, you know, because of structural racism, a lot of communities of colors don't live past the age of age. 85. So, sorry, I think there's an echo. Can you hear me okay? There was an echo. Maybe somebody got on the phone who needs to mute. So, so, yeah, so age is one way. And then, you know, essential workers, which includes a lot of um, people of color, were sort of deprioritized. So some, some of the access piece was around eligibility, who was eligible. But then even once you're eligible, the fact that you might have to use Wi-Fi or spend a whole day trying to get an appointment, you know, the system in Massachusetts was not set up at first to serve everyone. They did later on put in the call lines 211 and they did set up this pre-registration. So you can put your information in and then they, they will let you know when it's your turn. So there were corrections that were made along the way, but at the beginning it was very much a, whoever can get that one appointment, stay up till midnight, can get their daughter, their granddaughter and their to do it. So there were a lot of um, challenges along the way that replicated a lot of, yeah, on, on the issues of questions and, and hesitancies and worries, I think that's a lot for tonight. Yeah. Yeah. Cassandra, were you going to come in? Yes. Can you hear me? Now, now we can. Okay, perfect. Um, so I think you had two parts. You said access and the second piece was... You know, people wanting, people needing to be convinced uh, or have their questions answered. Uh, so, 
I can definitely chime in on that. Working at Brigham and Women's, I was on the unit um, as a nurse director right in the beginning of the surge. And towards the tail you know, end of it, while there was vaccine talks, um, I'll tell you that the population, the community of color that works at the hospital were very hesitant. And what you heard was, well, you know what? I don't trust it. And a part of it is our history the Tuskegee, the syphilis study, Henrietta Lacks. Those types of conversations came to the forefront where people had valid concerns about the vaccine. And what the hospital did, which at first people were skeptical about, but I thought it was good, was they provided data every week, every day by race, by who was getting the vaccine. And so what we realized was a lot of the nurses, aides, uh, environmental housekeepers who were from communities of color felt that they didn't trust it and they needed to hear from leaders of color to talk mm -hmm. to them about it. And a small subset, a small group of leaders at the Brigham decided to do a special presentation similar like this for them because a lot of the hospital forums, first of all, the terminology that was used, a lot of the people didn't understand it, right? So some people didn't even understand what they were talking about. So they broke it down in simpler terms so people could understand the vaccine, what was in it, what the importance behind it. And as we started to do things like that, you started to see the number go up of people of color who were getting vaccinated at the hospital. And I do think the weekly data that was given to them, percentages that showed how many people were getting the vaccine. And so, and, and I felt that that was really important, even for me as a nurse leader of color, talking to people. And the first question they had was, are you getting it, right? Are you gonna get it? And what is your why? And so you, you saw this flurry of what, this is my why, this is my why. And the biggest thing that we had to convince people and not even convince people to share is that it, it affects us disproportionately, right? If you look around and you see people that look like us are being hospitalized, so therefore we should actually be able to understand why we should get the vaccine and get vaccinated. So as soon as I got my vaccine, I let everybody know <laughs> and I wore it proud. I had my sticker. I put it on my social media accounts and I explained to people it wasn't a fancy explanation. It was just this is my why. I had a son in the surge, just to share quickly. I wanted people to see him. I, I didn't want to show him in a window. I wanted people to, I wanted to hug my family. And, and just breaking it down like that and sharing that, I think it made a huge difference. Yeah, I really, yeah, thank you for sharing that. Um, Mary, I'm going to ask Kimberly to share. I will, but I want to ask you because I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I will not tell you, but you know, I just wanted to just ask a quick question when, and I, and this is for all, maybe all three of you. Um, Cassandra just made a comment about like data. Um, do you think if we provided data for people, like people in BHA housing, like something they can read and, and something like real tangible, do you think that would make a difference for people? Like it did at the hospital, but what about like people who don't work in the hospital, people who are afraid or have questions? What do you think about data? Well, I, for, I think actually that the, the best thing are conversations like this, and then people who are participating in conversations like this, asking all the questions they think might be asked of them, um, so that they feel comfortable um, uh, giving the answers. People all, you know, uh, respond to numbers somewhat, but more importantly, people respond to stories. And, uh, and I, I think that we also have to acknowledge that there's, this is a very new thing. The virus is new, the vaccine is new. And to sort of you know, suggest that you just line up, we told you it's fine, um, is not to recognize the history and uh, that, that people have to have the opportunity to express their valid concerns, that they shouldn't be dismissed. And um, you know, so numbers help a bit, and the numbers are really good. I think it's now down to just 10% of people of African descent saying that they never want to get the vaccine. And that's a big drop um, from where it was at the beginning, suggesting that professionals like Cassandra stepping forward and um, telling their stories, um, a whole group of people from the National Academy of Medicine, which is uh, 
uh, I don't know, it's made up of very eminent people. Um, uh, you know, 60, uh, 60 of its African-American members made a, a big statement um, saying, you know, we're, we're part of this community. We, we're the people who are in, this, in the supermarket line with you. And we want you to understand that this vaccine is safe, effective, and you should get it. And I also wanted to add that right now in this moment, in this time we're living in, it is very it is very sensitive for people of color right now because there's a lot of different things going on. And I think part of also now dealing with heightened emotions on everything is really listening to people and understanding why they don't want it. And some of it is, is not, it. some of it doesn't even have anything to do with the Tuskegee. I've talked to people and it's simple things like, well, you know, the last time I went to the doctors, when I told them I couldn't breathe, they said it was nothing. And so it's opened a bigger conversation of people listening, listening to communities of color when we're in pain. Uh, there's also been talks about how oxygen saturation, you know, actually works differently now in, in people of color. And for some people, that's not new. That's not anything new. But I think that there is a component to it where there's a lot of sensitivity. And that's something that we really have to examine, because I've noticed it even having discussions with people about it, that that there's just a sensitivity where they even say, well, you know, there might be a different vial that's just for us. And so I think that there's that, that there's something more to it than that. Mm. Thank you. Um, Ade, was you gonna were you gonna say yeah. something? I see you're unmuted. Mm -hmm. uh, can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. Yes. I just wanted to add to what Dr. Mary was saying. It's not that for for people like us that are not medically inclined. One of the big keys trust. So mm -hmm. you get this data, but mm -hmm. every day it seems like the data is shifting. Like yesterday, you're hearing about you need a booster shot. Then mm -hmm. it's almost like from a personal experience, it's one bad apple ruins the tree. You know people personally mm -hmm. that maybe after they take it, now they have an headaches. And mm -hmm. that goes around that, you know, the data is not addressing that, but you know that person personally that even after they took the vaccine, you know, they got like COVID still. So you have that trust of the data mm -hmm. is constantly up and down. There's always something new about it. And it's almost seems like the medical field doesn't know. It's evolving every day and it's shifting. So, so you, you tip to on that line of waiting first to see, do they know enough yet? Or do you trust it enough? So it's just a trust mm -hmm. thing. Natalia, that you want to make a comment? No, I, I think it's acknowledging that the data is constantly changing. Yeah. Um, so, Ade just said something about like <laughs> a headache and Ade, my headache has nothing to do with the vaccine. Okay. I, just to <laughs> I got it. a headache from the vaccine. <laughs> um, so, um, you know, I, I, when you think about like what Ade just said about like research is like doc, people are always doing research. We're going to constantly be doing research, right? We go to the doctors, doctors practice medicine, right? That's what they do. They practice. It's like, there is no real guarantee. Like when you, so this is my point. I'm gonna share my quick, my story and why I decided to do it. And when, when they first start talking about it, I was like, there's no way, no, absolutely not. I'm not doing that. Oh no, they're not gonna practice on me. They've been killing black people. Enough black people have died. I'm not having it. And then I really said, I, I, I prayed, because that's what I do. I prayed about it and I was like, what, like what, what should I do? And I thought about all the people were dying. I thought about all the bodies that I saw in the news in New York. I thought about how afraid I was, I was for months and I did not want to leave my house from fear, anxiety, like just had me, it was, it was absolutely ridiculous. And, and I decided that I go to the doctor and I trust these doctors to give me medication for different things that I, that I, that I, you know, may have an illness in my body. I might, and their side effects. And, and I've been getting vaccines for years. I got like, since I was a kid, I've been getting vaccines just so I can go to school. So why can't I get this vaccine that could possibly save my life? That's one. Two, I wanted to set an example for my children. I wanted to set an example for my mom. My mom's 74 years old. I want my mom to live past 100. And so I made a decision for me to take the vaccine and I'm happy with it. I had no side effects whatsoever. Um, 
I didn't think so. I had a headache, but I suffer with migraines all the time. <laughs> it, it's just what it is. So, you know, that's my story and why I chose to. Um, and I'm going to just move along to the next um, um, question. And it is for um, Cassandra. So can you share what you're seeing in the hospitals now compared to what was going on a year ago? Sure. Um, so right now, first and foremost, we, here I go with the data again. So we do get a breakdown of the COVID patients that we have in the hospital. And I wrote it down because as of this morning, we have, so this morning we have five COVID positive patients in our ICU, okay? And just to give you an idea, um, our ICU, we can hold up to 100, 120 patients. We have five, okay? Mm -hmm. And on our medical surgical floor, so that's the, the whole entire hospital that has like 350, 400 beds, we have 13. We have 13 COVID positive patients and five ICUs. So that's a total of 18, wow. okay? And out of those five ICU patients, three of them are on the ventilator. And I'm bringing that up because this time last year, I was on a conference call where we were talking about renting ventilators from Boston Children's Hospital. We were talking to medical centers in New York. We were talking to centers, I believe in Canada because we were running out of ventilators. We had upwards of 120 plus ICU patients and pretty much we created a second COVID hospital in one of our buildings. Hmm. So we had over, we had over 250 ICU uh, uh, COVID positive patients. Wow. And right now we have 18. So this is miraculous. And what we didn't know back then was what we didn't know. We didn't know what we didn't know. We weren't even wearing masks. We weren't even wearing masks this time last year. Right. So now we have a whole entire hospital where everybody's wearing masks. All the common areas are limited to only four people. Right. We have different entrances for our employees and our patients. There are signs everywhere in the hospital that tell you where you can eat. We have food trucks because we are discouraging people from eating inside. We have food trucks so people can sit outside and there are heated lamps overhead. It's a mm -hmm. totally different world. And I can actually tell you that, again, to share when I came back from my maternity leave, I felt safer at the hospital than mm -hmm. I did go into the supermarket mm -hmm. because of the change that they made. And everybody has a mask. Everybody's handed a mask. You wash your hands. You have to fill out a quick survey saying how you feel, if you have fevers, et cetera. And so we have come such a long way. And to the gentleman's point about everything is changing and it's telling you something, it was the same thing in the hospital. And we had to have faith and believe that it would get better because it's it, as as cheesy as it sounds, we're all in this together. And we literally started with not knowing and having over 300 COVID patients to now 18. So I'm really proud. I'm happy about that at the Brigham. And I'm sure that it's like this at the other hospitals because there are conference calls every day about what's going on with the area hospitals. Are numbers spiking? Is there a spike? Is there a bump? And there's a lot of eyes on this. And I think that's refreshing. There's a lot of eyes and ears and conversations constantly talking about COVID to help the community, right? And so the Brigham and Women's is right in Mission Hill, okay? We cater to all types of patients, especially communities of color. And so it's important for people to know that and see the difference of what the hospital looks like today. Yeah, Brigham and Women's is my hospital. I've been going there for over 25 years. Mm. Natalia, Dr. Natalia. Um, mm. As an epidemiologist, I can't, let me stop. As an epidemiologist, I, can't, I don't know why I can't say it now, but what do you think could be the impact on our communities and our health system if not enough people take the vaccine? Thanks for that question, Kimberly. And I think, you know, it's really reassuring to hear what Cassandra is saying, that they're not seeing um, ICU beds filled. I mean, Last year, we were talking about flattening the curve through our behaviors. And I think the vaccination has helped. 
something like 75% or more of those highest risk patients, the, the eldest, those who are most likely to end up in the ICU have been vaccinated in Massachusetts. So that's great. I think as a public health person, not a medical clinician, not someone who sits, you know, who sees day to day, I'm looking at trends and there are some worries. Um, I think Massachusetts is slightly, you know, we plateaued and now we're maybe upticking again. Um, so vaccines are not a silver bullet. They're not going to change everything until we reach what Dr. Bassett mentioned is herd immunity. So a key message is that we need to um, get the vaccine, but keep our social distance. And I'm going to switch a second and say, as a mom of three kids, you know, my kids won't, they're all under the age of 16. So none of them are eligible for the vaccine, right? So all our kids um, below the age of the 16 won't be eligible for a bit longer, maybe the end of this year, maybe next year. So vaccination is important in communities, but also making sure that that protects those around us. We know now from the data that actually people who are vaccinated are less likely to transmit. So I got my vaccine this morning and I got it because I live with three little kids and I want to lower their risk. I don't want to be worried about going to see, you know, grandparents and, and worried about being that link, you know, being that transmission. I wasn't worried about myself as much as finding out later that I caused someone else to get sick or one of my kids getting sick and worrying like, did I bring it home? from the grocery store. So because our kids and in communities, you know, where people live in, you know, multi family households, you know, seven, eight of us, 10 of us in like a small apartment, you know, I, I moved from New York, we were five of us in two bedrooms. Now we are in three bedrooms, we're a bit better. But in that sense, you know, being able to think about vaccines as protecting yourself, but also protecting your family and your neighbors is really important until we get to herd immunity. I'm glad you said that. And I, I just want to um, paint a picture for like people who are living in houses, right? And in, in housing like myself, and we have these tiny apartments, right? And so for most of the, uh, of the beginning of the pandemic, I stayed closed in my room. I couldn't even be around my family, right? Because they worked in food service, all of my children. Mm -hmm. And then I was so worried about them coming home, bringing it to me. Another reason why I got the vaccine. Another reason why my, at least two of my sons so far are convinced to get the vaccine. I'm super excited. If I get the other two, then we'll all be okay. So when they go out, like we don't have to worry about like passing it around. So, you know, I encourage people um, who are living in housing in these small, tiny apartments, like really think about it. Um, and so I'm gonna move to the next question <laughs> and, um, this question is going to be for um, Dr. Mary and for Cassandra. And uh, Dr. Mary, you can go first. Um, I want you to speak about the safety of the vaccine. Mm. And also, you know, people are worried about side effects. Can mm. you speak on what people should expect? Mm. So the vaccines all were uh, determined to be safe and effective on the basis of, of clinical trials. And what those are, when they take, these were big, 30,000, 40,000 people, um, some of whom are given by chance, um, not by choice, but are by chance given the vaccine. So that's why they're called randomized clinical trials. And they, it showed that the two, the first two that were given emergency use approval back in December, um, had protection, meaning that they reduced the risk of COVID infection and COVID symptoms and, um, and severe and hospitalizations and death by something close to 95% compared to people who hadn't gotten the vaccine. And, the, um, and there weren't um, important complications. The side effects that people should expect are uh, pain at the injection site. So it's always a good idea to offer up your non-dominant arm. So if you're right-handed, have them give you the, 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 um, the jab in, in your left arm. Uh, and then people may have sort of flu-like symptoms. Um, and those shouldn't last more than a day or two. And they are, you know, they're not pleasant, but, um, and, and people are advised to be prepared to, you know, to take time off, um, but they're not serious. Um, so the, there have been um, no clearly identified serious complications of these vaccines. Now, the 
main complications of vaccines, I'm told by people who do this kind of work, vaccinologists, usually emerge within six weeks. And it's all, we're way past that. 160 million people have gotten the vaccine in the United States. And we're, you know, and this is for months now. Um, so that ought to be reassuring to everyone. I think it is. That's why more and more people are coming forward and, and agreeing to the vaccine. It may be that there are very rare things that we don't find in trials because they require you to have immunized millions of people to identify them. Some people may have heard about clotting concerns and things like that. These are extraordinarily rare. Um, and they're so much rarer than, than COVID, um, than the risk of COVID, that you, we always have to balance these risks. Unfortunately, that's part of life. We are balancing a risk when we decide to cross the street you know, <laughs> and uh, so in, in life, we're always balancing risks. And these vaccines, all of them, all three that have been approved are, um, you know, are safe and effective. And you may expect some minor discomfort. Thank you. I don't really have anything to add. That was a great um, response. I, I, I agree with everything okay. what Dr. Mary said. Awesome. I'll go on to the next question. Um, so others wonder if, if they have cancer or autoimmune disease, if they're pregnant, allergies, or any kind of physical ailment. Should they take the vaccine? And this, I'll let you answer. Let Cassandra. I, I mean, I'm... Yeah, I'll let Cassandra answer this. Yeah. I would advise them to talk to their primary care provider. Um, absolutely talk to their primary care provider first before um, they go in and take the vaccine. That's what I would say. Dr. Mary, it's you again. I'm sorry to like keep bombarding you. That as of today, um, I think it was as of today, you know, the age keeps ratcheting down. Um, and it, as of today, it's people 55 and older or people who have conditions that place them uh, at higher risk of having a serious case of COVID-19. And the, the list is pretty long. It includes diabetes, it includes obesity, um, it, it includes um, it, cancers. And um, so it, it really is a good idea to, um, to check in. The list is on the website and talk with your doctor as well. Um, the uh, eligibility is really greatly widened now and uh, more and more people should should be able to get vaccinated. And it I started out at 65, then it went, no, it started out at 75, then it went to 65, and now we're at 55, so. Yeah, I was going to add, uh, Dr. Bassett, that when I got the vaccine today, the only questions they asked me about were very serious allergies, if I have had anaphylactic shock before. That's basically something where they there is a counterindication, but for most things, you're actually at higher risk of, of having serious COVID complications. And that's why you got priority. That's what Dr. Bassett was talking about. The idea of if you have had cancer, if you were a smoker, actually your chances of, of faring worse because of COVID. So you actually, if you have those other conditions, uh, you're likely at the front of the line and you should be extra encouraged by us, but do talk to your doctor. You know, we are not, we don't know case by case, but um, it is because, you know, those things go together and sometimes you might have worse COVID um, outcomes if you have things, you know, you should, you should be talking to your doctor. And I know there have been some rumors around fertility and the, the vaccine. I've been getting text messages from friends who are saying, you know, I want to have kids at some point. Will the vaccine cause infertility or I'm pregnant? I know from every single pregnant doctor or nurse practitioner or healthcare worker who I know got vaccinated, um, every single one of them. And I don't know if, if uh, Dr. Bassett or Cassandra, if you want to speak at all to that around fertility, because it has come up in a lot of conversations I've been having. It has come up and it's interesting because I work with a lot of nurses who are uh, predominantly women who are a childbearing age. And it's interesting, different OBGYNs have been telling them different things. And that's why, and I was surprised by that. So because of that, I actually have 
encourage them to talk to their OB because it's so individualized, it seems. Now, the people that I know in my closer community have gotten vaccinated and have been fine. And so it's interesting to hear that. Um, so I, 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 I don't know, Dr. Bassett, if you have anything to add to that. No, I'm not aware of any data to support the concern. And I, I, we haven't talked at all about how vaccines work. But I, I know many people have been kind of spooked by the idea that they're getting genetic material from a virus put into them. And that, you know, they think somehow, is this going to get into my DNA? Um, and, um, and, and the fact is that the, the reason that the virus DNA, uh, DNA in the case of the Johnson & Johnson, RNA in the case of the um, two initial Pfizer and and Moderna vaccines are, um, is not because it can get into our DNA. It's the blueprint um, for that spiky protein that all of you have seen pictures of the vaccine have, have seen that seems to be one of the first things our body recognizes about this virus. So in a way, all vaccines work is to prime our bodies to be ready with antibodies and other parts of our immune system to fight against viruses without having been infected. So we get that by being exposed to the surface of these viruses and uh, without being exposed to the virus itself. So I can't think of any mechanism, I really can't, whereby um, either one of, any one of these, these vaccines would affect fertility. I just can't, I, I don't know how that would work. I mean, people get, um, you know, viral infections while pregnant. It's true that, um, that, you know, we don't want people to get certain vac viral infections while they're pregnant, uh, but that makes it all the more reason to get a vaccine, right? Um, so that you, you, won't, um, you won't be as, have as much risk of getting the actual virus. So, I, so that is my advice. You know, some of this, because it is all new, we have to go by what we would expect the mechanisms to be. And, um, and so it's a good idea to address worries and concerns by thinking through like, how would that work? And, um, and I, I can't see any way these vaccines would affect fertility. In other words, lower the chance that somebody could have a baby in the future. Can you ask a question real quick? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I got one. Uh, I have to take advantage of Dr. Mary Bassett. That's experience right there, Natalia. Quick question. Some of my friends were wondering how interactive are the vaccines, right? Yesterday we were watching you have to get a booster, a mm. booster shot if you're taking yours last year. So let's say you take the Pfizer one. Can mm -hmm. you get a booster from a Moderna shot or Johnson & Johnson? So how uh. interactive are these vaccines itself? So are they interchangeable? So there are three that are approved in the US. There are two that use, I, I, I hate to get too geeky, but there are two that use something called messenger RNA, uh, which is the actual blueprint for the protein. And then the, there's another one that uses DNA that has to make the RNA and then that will make protein. So, um, and they're not really interchangeable. The recommendation is that because nobody did that in the trials. Um, so they weren't, you know, they weren't tested in that way. Um, so the, um, the one that you got the first time is the one that we ideally you should get the second time, but still better if you're on a two dose regimen to get a second shot, a second dose, uh, even if it doesn't match the first dose. Um, so I don't know how good an answer that is, but if you went somewhere and all they had is Pfizer and your first dose was Moderna, you should take the Pfizer as a second dose. Um, if you are, but ideally the whoever vaccinated you the first time should be prepared to give you um, the second dose of the same vaccine that you got the first time if you got Pfizer or Moderna. The Johnson & Johnson has the advantage of being a single dose vaccine. And so if you get that one, you, you don't have to worry about getting a second dose. So I go does back. That, does that answer your question, Are they? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. So it, try to stick to the same vaccine. And I was going to say, 
I'm sorry. You're just watching it. They're saying it like a year later. That was. On oh, CNN. I see. Oh, you're talking you about you know, that we are out, and yeah. the answer to that is it may. <laughs> okay. We don't know yet, uh, but so far it seems to be good out to six months, and uh, you know we just haven't had that long to see uh, to assess protection, but. They're keeping track of that. And as you've heard, millions and millions of people have been vaccinated. And as we go along, we'll learn more about how long the vaccine seems to uh, provide protection. It may be that we'll have to you know, get boosters from time to time, but um, we just don't know yet. Natalia, do you, uh, have you kept followed this more? No, no, I was just going to say that from personal experience, I got vaccinated at Heinz Convention Center, and that's one of the mega ones. You know, they expect 7,000 people a day to go through there. And the minute I got the vaccine in my arm, I got a, a, a phone uh, alert saying you can now schedule your second one. I was very impressed that it happened on the spot. Um, but I think on your question about the booster, it won't matter. In a year, it won't matter whether you got Pfizer this time around, next time, you know, we will know more in a year's time. So it's not that you have to stay consistent. It's what, um, you know, Dr. Bassett was saying, for this time around, stick to the, the same one, whichever one you get. But in a year's time, we might have other options too. You know, we, we don't know. And that's the, the beauty of uh, how fast the, the science and the knowledge. And I just want to add, because speed has been something that has come up in a lot of questions. Um, I heard one of the, one of the PIs who was leading one of the trials, he said, you know, we did not cut any corners. What we did is we got a huge investment, a boost, both in money and people and the world scientists coming together for this cause. And we have never seen such cooperation and such an investment in terms of money. So we didn't have to cut corners. So yes, it went fast for, for many, you know, it seems to have gone fast, but there was a lot of work had been done in you know previous years, this technology was not developed overnight, and with the investments that the world put into this vaccine, it's it's no wonder. So just being really clear that no corners were cut uh, with this vaccine. Thank you for saying that, um, Natalia, because I know a lot of people that I've been talking to, friends and coworkers, like, oh, they rushed it, they rushed it, and so my first quite answer to them, they didn't like it wasn't rushed, and I said, yeah, you know what, it was rushed because they had to rush. They rushed, but they got all these smart people together and they got all this money together, right? So that they can come up with something that works like the world literally stopped. And so it was rushed, but in a good way. Yeah, so go ahead. No, I was gonna add exactly. And, and part of me, you know, because I'm from public health worries like, you know, why couldn't we have rushed on HIV or on other things? Like, can we, can we continue to partner and, and not worry and, and really invest in public health in the way that, that we need to, to fight some of, of these issues? As we should, we need to figure it out. Um, so um, this question is directed to you, Dr. Mary. Oh, were you gonna say something? Go ahead. No, I was also gonna say that part of the problem has been, as Natalia has been saying, um, that there just hasn't been much money in vaccines, right? The childhood illnesses, the, um, you know, um, in general, there's not much money to be made. And so that has slowed things down. And, and I think Natalie is right that we should now challenge the, the scientific community and the pharmaceutical companies to use this type of zeal to tackle other big problems like that. Uh, I don't know if there's a if there's a SARS one vaccine out there yet. I don't think there is one um, uh, because it sort of went away and uh, they decided not to carry on with the vaccine development. Fortunately, we got to benefit for it, from it for this, but you, we we can we've seen what science can do when there's money and commitment. So, so now my question. <laughs> Actually, I was just going to say, because we, we're getting close to the end. We have like 14 mm -hmm. minutes left. So I don't know if I want to keep bombarding you guys with questions, but if there's something you just want to chat about, think, things that you think might be helpful to encourage mm -hmm. people to get this vaccine, I feel like we can have a conversation here and mm -hmm. anyone can um, lead that conversation. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that um, the main things that I've heard people say worry them are this was so fast. How did they come up with the vaccine uh, in you know less than a year's time when the previous record was four years? And we've talked about that. 
uh, we've talked about this concern that people have that somehow they're going to be segmenting the population and sending bad vaccine to communities of color or being less attentive to whether it's been stored properly. Um, and uh, I, I hope that we've addressed that. Um, I mean, obviously, it wouldn't work at a place like the this mass vaccination site. Uh, and there are clear ways to, that they keep track of whether or not the, the vaccination has been uh, compromised. You, you know that, that uh, something like 15 million doses were forfeited uh, because it was found that there was some problem with them. So I think that that should give us confidence that there's a, you know, that there's a willing to acknowledge um, problems in, in maintaining the vaccine integrity and not to proceed to give these to people. I'm trying to think what else people have raised as concerns. Um, I, I hear a lot of long-term, what are the long-term? Like, what well, don't we know now, but we might find out in 10 years. Like, and, right. and how, can we, how can we think about that, um, either to Cassandra or Mary? Like, what, what do you think? How do, how do we think through that long-term potential? Mm -hmm. I mean, I can share what I say. What I answer to that is yeah. that we also don't know a lot about the long-term consequences of having COVID. What we know is that some people have severe, you know, we talk about life and death, but the people who survive COVID, so many stories of people having a really, really difficult recovery, uh, losing their sense of smell, uh, losing their, you know, other impacts. So the long-term consequences of COVID are also part of that trade-off that we're talking about. So yes, right. you may have something, but also getting COVID, even if you have it mildly, even if you survive it, you might have long-term consequences from that. So that's how I've been framing it. Cassandra, that's I don't know, or Mary. Hmm. That, that's a good answer too. And um, I also think it's paying attention to the fact that even with the vaccine, you can get COVID, however, there hasn't been any studies or any news that anyone that had the vaccine that got COVID was hospitalized. Okay. So, you know, we don't, you know, we want to make sure people understand that you can still get it, but it's mild illness. It is nothing like being in the hospital with the vent, you know, and, and like you said, looking at long-term side effects of having COVID where people still have shortness of breath, they still have muscle aches, they cannot return to the full person that they were before. So it's understanding that, you know, um, you can still get it. However, th there has not been any serious hospitalizations from anybody that has gotten it. Another thing I would just wanted to add is also right now, everybody is getting their information from different sources. And there's a lot of, you know, fake news. There's a lot of, um, you know, uh, in my culture, I have some of the elders are getting their news from WhatsApp. WhatsApp is their, their news channel. And I think that it's, it's good for people to start thinking about where am I getting this information from? Right. And kind of using consistent resources of where they get their information from. I know some people rely heavily on their church, you know, what their pastor says. And a lot of churches now are also offering things like this and getting good data out there and recommending using the CDC and different types of information, because I think that's the danger of it, where all it takes is one article, one YouTube video, one WhatsApp, and that spreads like wildfire. I got a text message that said, this is the cure for coronavirus. You know, you warm up some water, you know, you put a towel over your head. And, and so these types of things are really going out and there's yeah. going to be some people who really will believe that this, this is, you know, the cure and don't get the vaccine. So I do think it's also important for people to understand where you're getting your information from, who you're getting your information from. And if it's not somebody who is tied to the medical community, science community, you know, there's not going to be a lot of validity in that. And so that is one thing that I've been trying to encourage people because people want to debate, right? So people, second, you, they hear that you're from a medical background, they want to debate and prove you wrong, that, that it's fake. And so a lot of the times I say to them, well, it's a personal decision. 
first of all. To, if you don't want to get it, okay. But where are you getting your data? Where are you getting your facts from? Where are you getting your information from? It's very important for people to understand that. Yeah, so thank you for sharing yeah. that. I want to say that I'll let you jump in, Dr. Lai. I just want to just think about this like fake news. And I remember when the pandemic first started and people were like, oh, Black people can't get it. Black people can't get it. It was all over Facebook. And what happened? Black people were getting it at a higher rate than anybody. So we have to quit listening to fake news. Hmm. I was, I was going to add, as the, the white woman on this show, I mean, so many people have been trying to cut the line to get the vaccine. Wealthy people trying to figure out ways to pay their doctors to get in front of everybody else. So if that that should signal something like so many people are trying to cut the line. And, you know, now we're pretty much everybody within by April 19th. I think everybody in Massachusetts is eligible. But the fact that, you know, we see these inequities and so many white Americans haven't gotten it already, like maybe that should be a sign of like, OK, like, like there is there is something that they find very valuable, you know. I know so many people who are trying to figure out from a friend of a friend how they could get it. And you know, but but real here, I'm actually very worried about the global inequities. And Ade, you mentioned you're from Nigeria. I mean, we are seeing the US buy out in huge quantities. Canada, like so many of the wealthy countries have bought so much supply of this vaccine because it is, you know, one of the biggest tools we have to get back to normal. So in one way, I, I feel like we should be grateful um, that we live in one of the wealthiest countries in the world that has basically bought enough stock. You know, my parents live in Greece. They are nowhere close. The EU even, you know, it's wealthy, but they are not close to where we are. And, and parts of the world, they've vaccinated 1%, 2%. They're hoping to vaccinate all their healthcare workers. So in some ways, feeling it's okay to feel nervous, but also to feel grateful that we are in a place where the vaccine is available to us. And, and I don't know, I don't know how to share that feeling of like, we are lucky. We are really lucky that we have a chance in a few weeks to every single person in the US who wants it can get it. And that will mean that we can be with our families this summer. I mean, and that is not the case in much of the world. Uh, so, so Kimberly, I got a real quick, I'm sorry to chime in. This is my last one, I promise. Oh, you're I'm fine. Gonna, don't cut the line mean? no more. <laughs> this is for Dr. Natalia. That, uh, this is it's very important for people in a town because you, you work here locally and with the health department. So I'm focused on some of the disabled people. We hear about this rollout plan and people going there. Is there a specific plan for like the disabled in Brookline that can move around? For them yes, to get the there is a program for homebound. Um, there's a phone number and they will bring the vaccine to you. And I will look at it. It's 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 both at Massachusetts statewide and in Brookline specifically. So we will we should share that. I don't have it off the top of my head, but there is a program for anybody who's homebound, meaning that they can't travel to a site. Um, they will bring a vaccine to your your place. There is a program. That's what you meant, Daddy, right? Yes, uh, if we could get that to the people in Brooklyn. Yes. We have some disabled people. I will look at it right now while we're talking so I can share in a second. Thank you. So um, one, there was a, I just wanted to share that someone put in the um, question and answer um, that regarding pregnancy, MGH study recently published found that COVID immunity is passed from pregnant mothers to their babies. I just wanted to, someone left that in the chat. Yes, um, that's a good point to make. That's that's correct. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that Dr. Mary said in the beginning, the top of the program was like the best way, I guess, to convince people to get vaccinated is like to share stories or give information. So as we close out, um, and this is for all the, the three of you, what message do you have for anyone, you know, who's afraid to take the vaccine, um, including messages um, for community of colors who are have concerns. I really love the way Natalia just framed it, that we should consider it really a, a gift that we have access to a safe and effective vaccine. It's been given to 165 million people in the United States. If this was going to knock people over, I, I think we would have heard about it. And so there's no reason not to uh, accept that this is a safe and effective vaccine. We've heard about the declining numbers of people who are seriously ill. 
And that's the best thing about this vaccine is that it, um, it, it does appear that it will predict, prevent an uh, infection and keep us from infecting other people. But it also means personally that your risk of being hospitalized or dying um, is virtually eliminated. And the goal always of uh, health interventions is to save life. So we have something that can save lives. You should get your jab. Thank you. Um, Cassandra? I definitely agree with what Dr. Bassett said. And I, I think that people should educate themselves and also knowing the fact that like uh, Natalia said as well, it's a gift. It's a gift and a privilege to be able to have this vaccine. Knowing that even if you get vaccinated, you still have to wash your hands and wear your mask. Please, please, please wash hands, wear your mask, still exercise, social distancing. But the idea of we are a people, you know, communities of color, we love to fellowship and how we fellowship is, you know, we eat meals together, you know, we go to church and we do all these things. And right now, those things haven't happened. And it was really sad to watch Easter service online live stream. And so I've had a conversation with people saying, and, and somebody said, this is going to be the last time we're going to live stream because next year we will be together. And I think if people really want to do this and want to be together and fellowship together, then we've got to be on the same page, get the vaccine, wash your hands, wear your mask, um, and do this together. Thank you, Natalia. Well, first, let me give the vaccination call center number. That's 617-879-5636. Um, you can assist, ask to get a vaccine to your home if you ever, if under normal circumstances, you would have difficulty leaving to go to a medical appointment. So it's 617-879-5636. My, you know, my last point is that it's okay to change your mind. You know, I think some people feel like, no, no, I don't do this. And, you know, we have been changing a lot of things and it's okay. And it's okay today, or maybe a month ago when you were offered the vaccine to say no, and now to say, okay, now I'm ready. And we in the health community are here to continue answering questions and to want to get you there. And we are seeing so many people getting there. So take your time and come back, ask more questions and more questions. So don't, don't decide that I'm not getting it and then close your eyes and close the door. Say, I'm not getting it yet. And let's go from yet to I am now ready to get it. Okay. So keep that in mind because we want you to be there with in fellowship with everybody else. So I am here to answer any questions. I know Dr. Bassett is and Cassandra is and your neighbors and let's get there and we will get there at your, at your time. Wow. Thank you, ladies. That was awesome. Um, I appreciate all the words. It was, it moved me. Um, I have dropped a link for BHA residents to click on and um, so that they can try to sign up to get the vaccine. So that's our time. Thank you so much for being with us and get vaccinated. You'll be glad you did. Take care. Thanks, everybody. That was really a pleasure. <laughs> Good night. Thank you, Dr. Mary. God bless. Thank Thanks you so much all. for joining. Take care. Bye, everybody. Bye. You did yes, a great job, guys. Thank you.